I mean, just, you know, they're not being good social workers. Good social workers are grateful for their underpaid job and would not dream of being entrepreneurially responsible. So when they drive in their Mercedes or, or their, their Lexus back to see their friends on their way to their place up in the Adirondacks, they will be socially deviant because they'll be running a business. But if that business actually saves the people that this system is simply maintained in decay, which is a better human program? It takes a whole different mindset. Notice also who takes the risk. They keep the person on their payroll the first four months. So they're going to a business and saying, you get to try this person out for four months. You pay us. You don't have to fire this person. You don't get any lawsuits. This is designed to get around lawsuits. If you don't like this person on Thursday afternoon, they will not show up on Friday morning because they stay on our payroll. So they can go to the business. They have lowered the risk of hiring the marginally unemployed. They're now walking in and saying, hi, remember, remember the ladies you're talking about here? 15 years on, 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 on uh, welfare. Now she's going to go for the first time and show up at work. You're the average employer. This person has not been at work in 15 years. In fact, since ninth grade, so she may never have been at work. She's now showing up at you know, 32, 33 years of age saying, hi, I'm ready. Well, what, what America Works does is they internalize to them the risk of putting this lady at work. So the business has a much lower threshold of risk, so it can gamble bigger. But, but they've thought through an entire system which fits this model. And the thing I've been fascinated by is it has not led 50 states in the District of Columbia to automatically set up a similar incentive program. They just don't get it. I mean, they say, well, I understand all that, but here's how we operate. It's just astonishing to me. And, 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 I, and that's why I say generically, incentives work in America. And if you, don't, if you see a program that doesn't have an incentive, you ought to ask yourself why it thinks it's working. And then you ought to check to see if it is. And what you'll find is it's usually very inefficient. It usually achieves far below what it claims. Because this is a, this is a society drawn forward by incentives. One of the projects we developed in order to test out this theory was a program called Earning by Learning. It's a project we designed to implement a strategy to fulfill a vision. Our vision is that every child should know about free enterprise, should have a chance to earn a living, and should know about reading and writing. We wanted to set up a strategy of saying, let's move towards an incentive-based model that combines free enterprise and education in the same model. And the specific project we designed was what's called Earning by Learning. Now, earning by Learning is a model where we go into public housing projects or public schools and we say to second and third graders who are likely not to learn how to read, we'll pay you $2 a book for every book you read in the summertime. We just announced it, in fact, this week at Moton Middle School in Washington, D.C. where we're going to be doing it. Uh, we use adult volunteers, so there's no bureaucracy. We use public library books or public school books, so there's no in capital investment. The only money that goes in is to the kids. We use a room which is made free either by the school or by the housing project. And one of the reasons I became, frankly, a revolutionary uh, was we went into Douglas County and we went to a public housing project and eight-year-old eight kids said to us, you're going to cheat us. We said, what? These are eight-year-old kids. They said, you're going you're to get us to read all summer and then you won't pay us. Now, two things happened. The first was I decided if we're losing them at eight, if they're already so cynical at eight, they just assume we're lying to them, we're in big trouble. This is a huge cultural crisis and requires a revolutionary response. It requires a replacement response, not let's have a smaller circle or a slightly different circle. Let's get rid of this culture of poverty and violence and get to one you can trust that is decent. But second, in Douglas County, we said, fine, get, we won't ask you to trust us. We'll pay you every week. And what happened was, every week they increased the number of kids who were reading. Because when the ice cream truck arrived, the kids who had money to buy ice cream were standing there. Their friends would come over and say, how come you have money? And they go, well, I read, you know. <laughs> now, I want you to think about the health of a, no a notion that says, you should be proud of yourself, and you have some little cash in your pocket because you're a reader versus this system where there's no incentive, no sense of dignity, no sense of resources, no chance to become a customer. We also found, a little bit to our surprise, that these are actually pretty smart kids. Uh, 
when they'd earn 30 or 40 dollars, they'd mostly buy clothing. The number one expenditure was back to school clothing. On the other hand, how did you confirm that they were reading to teach you them? You had adult volunteers who went in who, had, who made them answer questions about their books. Now, Moton Middle School has gone a stage beyond me. They're tied into a program from Indianapolis, uh, which is a computer reading program, where the computer asks you the questions and you actually take a computerized test. And the computer is programmed to ask questions about 7,000 different titles. It's pretty amazing. I, I watched a couple kids taking the test. And so the kid gets this sense of, hey, they're just like all those fancy middle class kids because they're sitting right here at their computer in their school and they're working on a computer and you have to be able to read to use the computer. And the computer is asking them whether or not they took the, whether or not they read the book. So they've got to get five questions right about the book in order to pass the test. Of lessons there at the right. same time. And, and they're being taught free enterprise. It's okay to work. It's okay to make money. It's okay to do it honestly. You can actually improve yourself while you're working because you can become more literate. And we're giving them a big incentive. I mean, if you read uh, at, at $2 a book, uh, our top reader read uh, 83 books and earned $166. She was an eight year old girl in Villarica, Georgia. Her dad took a day off of work just to protect her. Because we paid her on, gradu on graduation day, and and she I mean she got 166 dollars in cash as an eight-year-old. Just but just but I'm trying to give you just a sense of a different, a totally different model. The principles of earning by learning are first that incentives work. Second that poor children are smart in practical ways. You've got to let them grow. You've got to give them a chance. And third that money is a powerful incentive. Now th this by the way I get in amazing arguments with people who are more traditional. Uh, folks who say, oh gee, isn't it sad you have to give them an incentive? And then I say, well now, if you're middle class, did your child have any incentive if they got straight A's? Did you reward them in any way if they did really well? Oh yeah, of course, I did, yeah. What's the difference? It's okay, but they don't get the idea that if you, if, that if you have in this model of the welfare state no incentives, why would you expect people to behave in positive ways? In addition, the principles of earning by learning include that a social good, learning, can be reinforced by a personal good, earning, and that people given a good idea will voluntarily follow up on their own, but can be helped by a supportive rather than controlling structure. In other words, that you can get into uh, a, an approach where you help people learn how to do it, you give them good tips, you encourage them, but you don't have a bureaucracy that micromanages and has reports and tries to look over their shoulder. The central theory is that efficiency in a democracy is very hard, but effectiveness is pretty easy. I'm going to draw that distinction a second. And frankly, persistence, persistence, persistence. Let me draw a distinction between efficiency and effectiveness. I don't know an efficient way to arouse 35 million volunteers. But I know if we could inefficiently get 35 million volunteers helping the poor, we'd begin to mop up the problem. Because even though they would individually be inefficient, the collective weight of that many people helping on the weekend, helping in the evenings, talking about it in their church or synagogue, talking about it over lunch at work, the sheer human energy involved would mop up the problem, even though it would be very inefficient. And I would argue that's how democracies work. They're not necessarily inefficient. Dictatorships are more efficient. They're just not very effective. But though what democracies do is they mobilize so much energy, they arouse so much excitement, that they, they are able to overcome their inefficiency by their enthusiasm. And again, that it, that it takes tremendous persistence. None of this is going to happen without a level of persistence that's hard to, to normally get. And that's why, when you, remember I listed the reform movements? What happens is, in a period of a reform movement, you have an explosion of energy, a sense that you've got to change things, a tremendous commitment to do something, the invention of a whole new series of structures and systems and habits. They change things dramatically and then they leave behind at the end of the decade systems that are new and more effective than the ones that they replaced. 